All right, good morning. Uh, welcome to our panel. We'll be discussing um, innovative tools available to the portfolio managers and researchers to get um, your ideas to the market faster. And um, uh, my name is Baha Rudin. Uh, I run buy side sales and account management for Active VM, where we um, help our clients make more money, mitigate risks, and uh, by uh, uh, optimizing their trading, risk management, and financial operations. Uh, my esteemed panelists, uh, why don't you, uh, why don't I let you introduce yourselves? Uh, hi, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Chandrez Desai. Uh, I'm a senior solution architect at the Rockery Group in Washington, D.C. Uh, Rockery Group is like one of the global investment firm and uh, managing like over $16 billion asset data management. Uh, I particularly are responsible for managing the cloud infrastructure uh, DevOps pipeline and the managing the different uh, data across the slice and dice things and also uh, managing like uh, uh, like security cloud uh, cloud security and uh, posture management yeah hi everybody my name is amy young i am um, what's called an industry advisor at microsoft it's an unusual role that was created three or four years ago as microsoft embarked on what it calls its pivot to industry. Um, this emerges from the acknowledgement that um, as technology has become more central to business strategy, business, you know, business decision makers are having a bigger impact on technology purchase decisions. So you can't just sell to IT anymore. And as as you know, as we tried to get our traditional sales force to engage with these line of business leaders, they discovered that you know it probably helps to have people who understand the industry really deeply, who have you know firsthand experience in it, in uh, when you're trying to open those kinds of doors. So I've been at Microsoft for four years, but my 25 year career spans various aspects of capital markets, wealth management, and management consulting. Um, so it's it's my job to engage with um, line of business leaders on their digital transformation challenges. And what's particularly interesting about the role at this point in time is you know, generative AI has become a hot button issue for business leaders. Um, historically, I've been, you know, when I knock on, on doors of, of line of business leaders, they look a little puzzled about why they should be talking to Microsoft. You know, they say, well, you know, I love, I love Teams, <laughs> but, you know, other than that, what, what do we have to talk about? And, uh, you know, this year that conversation has changed um, completely. So it's exciting to be here and talk about that. And hello, everyone. Matt Conweiser with IBM. And um, actually, I am what's called the, uh, the data, AI, and automation technical leader, or one of them, uh, for the company. And my kind of unique niche there is to focus on all of the new use cases and new capabilities and try and bring those to market in a business context, much like, like Amy's remit. Um, been at IBM for, actually it'll be almost 10 years and spent quite a bit of time in cybersecurity as well. And there is a huge overlap between cybersecurity and data AI and automation, especially with generative AI and the business use cases involved in it. So I'm very excited to be here. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much for uh, introductions. Uh, I would. I, I always try to engage the fan, uh, the, the audience. Um, can't can't see very well with, with the lights, but uh, now that you know who your panelists are, I wanted to um, ask you to raise your hands if you are in an investment management function. Anybody? Awesome. And what about technology? Uh, somebody who enables the. Uh, great. Well, um, I, I assume that. Uh, people who didn't raise hands, they still haven't had their coffee yet, so um, we'll, we'll, we'll proceed. Um, so I, I want to start with um, why this panel. So when Vidak and I spoke a few months ago, what might be interesting to this audience, um, I told him that I see a trend um, among our clients where they are pu there's a great push to uh, leverage as much technology as possible to um, expedite, the, to accelerate the time to market for the new trading ideas. And one example that we have is a client who cut their time to market from three to four months down to two weeks. And all of that is uh, possible with, um, with the tools that are available now and the tools that are coming. Uh, so I want to start uh, with uh, what is available now, what is, uh, what is wildly used at this point, 
And um, uh, maybe Chandrish, we'll start with you, given that you are the representative for the asset manager, and you can share what your team um, uses uh, for that uh, purpose. Yeah, sure. Uh, actually, in the Rock Creek, uh, we are gathering like a multiple source of data in terms of like data should be like a structured format, unstructured format, and semi-structured format. So this data we are gathering like multiple uh, sources like a different file structure format as well as uh, also getting the data from like vendor, the third party API, and we are uh, putting all the data into the, the central location in, uh, in the cloud. And from there, so this data, we are like first, like make it like a slice and dice. So to, for, for making the slice and dice, we need to use like heavy cloud native tooling, like we call it as like a data lake. So data lake is like a kind of uh, old traditional uh, uh, data warehousing concept. But like based on this data lake, uh, we are using um, uh, multiple tool like in AWS. Uh, and we are, that, that is our like a central location of the data of source there. And from that data source, we are making it uh, uh, as like a SageMaker, which is one of the machine learning and AI tool in AWS. And uh, that is the input with like multiple uh, input parameters. And uh, based on that SageMaker, we are like uh, train the model, like build the model and deploy into the different environment. So those those thing is like we are heavily used that. And uh, as it was a presentation layer, uh, from the like SageMaker. So SageMaker is like a middle layer, we can call it as. And, but the, for the presentation layer, uh, we are heavily used uh, the different uh, like in-house application there. And that application uh, getting the data from the SageMaker and the central repository is a data lake. And uh, we can also uh, use this data into the different business intelligence dashboarding tool like a Tableau or uh, that is recently introduced by AWS. There is a QuickSight uh, dashboard there. So QuickSight is one of the also uh, like a charting and uh, BI tool there. We are heavily used there. So so that the tool like uh, currently even Rock Creek, um, um, there are like a different analyst person there or the portfolio manager or um, uh, hedge fund manager, they are like, hey, we rely, rely on those dashboard and and those dashboard like kind of like a real time uh, data update. It's like a near real time, not like exact real time, but like there is a few second to minute lag there. But yes, yeah, so based on those uh, real time data that can uh, analyze the data and uh, more uh, decision making process according to that. Okay, so uh, I I um, I hear that. Uh, so to summarize, um, uh, your your team is looking to leverage uh, data of all types and um, to, to in order to make an analysis and decision. And uh, this is the trend that we also observe within our client base when you want to bring your um, uh, real time streaming data with uh, intraday data with historical data and be able to consume it on an ad hoc basis in a very uh, cost efficient manner. So I, I think um, you mentioned cloud and uh, that's uh, probably a, a big aspect of, 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 that, uh, of that process. So um, why don't we talk about um, a cloud as, a, as the enabler of, of, of this um, innovation and um, ability to um, access all, all, all the information that you have uh, in order to make the, the decisions that are required for in this function. So uh, Amy, why don't we um, start with you? Sure, so just um, just so everyone is clear, the, the AWS lingo that Chandresh just shared, Microsoft has all the same stuff. Um, our names are nice and easy to, to understand instead of something obscure like SageMaker, we just call ours Azure Machine Learning. Um, and now we have a groovy thing called Azure Machine Learning Studio um, that's our, our um, enhanced platform that, that specifically addresses a number of generative AI needs and use cases. But leaving the commercial aside, um, I think what's particularly interesting about this moment in time is, you know, the industry has been talking about alternative data for several years now. And what's, what's really, I think we're at an inflection point where corporations, so corporations have been on this journey to, to migrate to cloud for several years, and it's obviously been accelerating. And that, of course, becomes the raw material that enables alternative data of all types, right? So as cloud usage increases, alternative data will increase in proportion, or rather at a multiple of that. So one example I can give to make this tangible, 
Microsoft has, or th there's this thing called a digital twin. Um, that's uh, that's an assembly of different digital capabilities that's used in a number of different industries, um, typically in, in manufacturing or production types of contexts. So a couple years ago, Microsoft worked with one of the major oil companies um, to create a digital twin of a drilling rig in the North Sea. And when you create a drilling rig of a, of a facility, whether it's a manufacturing facility or a drilling rig or, or anything like that, you're putting a bunch of devices all over this, this um, facility to measure what happens at, everywhere across the facility at a level of detail that we never could before. And so, you know, this, 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 digi this particular digital twin we use as part of our ESG and sustainability you know, the, the data-driven nature of, of ESG measurement. Because now, like the, every barrel of oil that is produced by that, digital, by that drilling rig doesn't have the same carbon footprint. The carbon emissions from a drilling rig vary based on seasons, based on, you know, the, the geology, where you are in the, in the depth of the well. You know, I'm not, not an expert in that, but it varies dramatically. And so by creating this digital twin of this rig, we can now measure the carbon footprint of each individual barrel of oil, rather than, you know, just, okay, in the aggregate, this facility, its emissions over, over the span of a year are X. And so if you, if you take that one example, one drilling rig, you know, to, um, you know, I, I recently uh, did an event with the New York CFA Society where I talked about uh, um, a partner of ours called Ecolab that does this to measure the quality of water used in a soap production plant. So like, we're getting to this whole, like orders of magnitude, deeper detail on the types of alternative day that we can manufacture because of cloud. And so all of that becomes, you know, the the raw material input to investment decision making. So I think that's that's one area where, you know, everybody's, you know, over the moon excited about generative AI, but the it it sits on the, you know, it it's the cherry on top of a, a great deal of innovation, you know, starting with the internet basically, but then going to cloud, then to APIs then to traditional machine learning, you know, all, all of these things build upon each other to get us to this moment where we're at right now. Um, and I think that it's really important to look at that broader context of what cloud is enabling. Well, that's a fascinating example. And I think it's a great setup for the last panel of the day where they're going to talk about alternative uh, data. Uh, and, um, but uh, having all of that, all of that data available, how, how do we bring it to, to the end users? So maybe, uh, I don't know if, if any of you can uh, t touch upon that because uh, it's, uh, it's, you have to be able to use it. Yeah, so I'll start. Um, so I think that the, the secret there is actually the cloud, right? Because um, everybody has use cases for AI and everybody is using AI. The, the problem has always been that it is a significant amount of resources, uh, not just in terms of compute space and rack space, but also environmental impact to build and train and house your own models, right? So the availability of cloud and the acceptance of the use of cloud, especially in heavily regulated businesses like finance and healthcare, has allowed access to those services where previously really wasn't possible. Uh, it's also done it on a much different cost basis. It's much less expensive now. You can put down a credit card and for a couple hundred dollars a month, you can get a cloud instance. And for a little bit more, you can get access to uh, a semi-private uh, you know, machine learning model. So, so I think that's made it accessible to, to the masses. The other thing, that is really important, especially when we talk about usage of, of front-end applications with these cloud services is we're, we're really back to a mainframe model, right? So if you think about mainframe, it was a heavy compute resource in a central facility with, at the time, coaxial cables running to thin terminals. And we're right back to that. 
after about 20 or 30 years of everybody being about building the biggest, best desktop computer you could make, we're back to a mainframe model, except now we call it cloud. But that has allowed us to create these very powerful applications and provide them to lots of different types of users on lots of different types of devices, regardless of what those devices are. Um, so that's, that's the first thing. The second thing I'll mention, and this is really more of a, of a transformer foundation model AI innovation, is that the interface to these systems is now natural language. You don't need to be an expert in Python or coding to ask a, an AI system to do something for you. And that is tremendous because one of the things I hear a lot when I do these types of talks and I also do some community AI training and, and classes is I'm gonna be out of a job. You know, I don't know Python, I can't code, I'm never gonna be able to work with this. And then when we sit people down and actually play with AI and they realize it's as easy as speaking to another human being, they realize that the knowledge they have from the decades of work that they've done becomes more valuable in the new models with the new applications because they have experience that younger coders may not have. So they're working on the back end, the coders are working on the back end, and you've got the highly skilled knowledge people in the different industries working on the front end, and that becomes a bridge between the two of them. So that's, that's what we're seeing from a trend perspective. If I, if I could add to that, I think, I think we're missing an important middle layer here. Um, and so, and I, I, you know, as I said in my introduction, you know, I'm a capital markets practitioner by training, right? Not a technologist. So I show up at Microsoft four years ago, you know, and, and I figure cloud is infrastructure, much, much like you described. But what's interesting is cloud is actually a, a series of Lego blocks. And when I started at Microsoft four years ago, I think we had something like 70 different Azure services. And so think of each Azure service as a Lego block. And, you know, I'm, I'm old enough to, to have played with Lego as a kid when there were probably about 20 different types of Lego and that was it, right? And then I, you know, I bought Lego for my kids and Lego, we have this, you know, a bazillion different types of Lego pieces. And so when you have different types of Lego pieces, you could do way cooler stuff, right? Versus just having, you know, the eight dot blocks and the four dot blocks and the two dot blocks. And so that's what's happening with cloud. We've gone from having like 80 Azure services when I joined four years ago to today, I think we have over 300. So think of those as new types of Legos. And what's, what this means to business stakeholders is that they can innovate much more quickly. This is part of the reason that we're seeing so much more innovate, the, the pace of innovation with this whole generative AI thing has been faster than we've ever seen before. You know, we're, we're seeing lots of new startups that are, that are assembling these Lego blocks in innovative ways to create solutions for all of you. So it's, you know, I, my, my, the perspective that I would try to enforce, reinforce with, with an investment audience is you've, you've, it, you know, I would encourage you to, to really try and learn a, a little bit about cloud. Um, you know, to Matt's point, it's, you don't have to be very technical to understand the strategic importance of this because it's, it's not just infrastructure. It, you know, the, the world where when you wanted to do something with a system and IT came back to you and said, it's going to take two years and cost 50 million bucks. That's not the cloud allows them to come back to you and say, yeah, we can spin up an MVP of that in a couple of weeks and the cost is entirely variable. And so you can change the way you work, you know, extremely quickly. I, yeah. Uh, yeah, I would like to add one point, like as Amy mentioned, right, they're like uh, uh, cloud is a Lego pieces there. So, for example, like before the cloud, so it's a data center world there. So let's say, for example, if you need to uh, install or any software or any AI models or like train the models, we need to install like many uh, applications into the data center and we need to ask to the uh, network person to let's say, make it more secure 
and make it connectivity with different like uh, sources and uh, software there but like once the cloud has been uh, there so we can like uh, directly install or uh, create a, like a managed service uh, or like we can like uh, access the managed service and we can also create a, like infrastructure as a code that means like uh, for example if you need to create a SageMaker or, or open ai or azure any services there we can we can all uh, create a pipeline using the infrastructure as a code uh, we can also check the security perspective and we can also predict the cost actually before before actually implementing into the cloud so those part are like part of the infrastructure as a code and uh, so let's say for example if you need uh, this model to run for just like eight hours a day then you can just spin up this uh, entire infrastructure into just for the eight hours and make it down after business hours so you don't like you know pay any cost for that so this is like completely pay as you go so that means like you can also uh, saving a lot of cost based on those uh, infrastructure as a code and uh, in the cloud native tools there yeah thank you and uh, I, I was going to say that you you have a very um um accessible way to explain all this technology. Uh, I, when I was researching the panelists, I came across your LinkedIn page and there's a lot of information uh, that, is, um, uh, that you popularize uh, for, for cl uh, cloud technology. So to Amy's point, uh, it's, not that, um, it's not that difficult to understand and it um, really makes a difference to, to get a little bit uh, under the hood and, and, and see how it all works. Um, so I wanted to, um, uh, well, m maybe we can pivot in, in, into um, AI uh, at this point uh, and kind of t tie, tie together the, uh, the capabilities of, of, of cloud, the ability to do, uh, to spin up all these environments where the end user can uh, quickly work on something uh, on their own, whether uh, at this point they might have to know Python or they might be some uh, AI-based applications where uh, where that is already available, and um, ex expedite the whole process to uh, time to market for for the say new trading strategy. And uh, I think we heard a lot about AI yesterday, and if. Um, uh, I think if I had everyone raise their hand again and ask how many of you uh, used uh, AI-based uh, powered apps uh, this year, it probably will be 90% of the audience, but a year ago it will be less than 10% probably, something like that. So the, the speed of adoption is definitely something um, of... Um, of a marvel, and and uh, it leads to a lot of um, democratization of the of the tools that are available that we historically gated behind a certain set of skills, and I think um, Amy, you you talked about uh, uh, that a little bit on uh, how um, AI enables the uh, democratization of quant tools, and um, Matt also had. Um, a, a, a few points that uh, that we discussed uh, before, so maybe we can jump into that and um, or focus on the use cases of um, where AI can help with us um, uh, in the context of our uh, panel discussion. Who who would like to start? Well, I guess I I would start with let's let's start with a, a broad statement that um, every asset manager, whether they're private equity, quant, fundamental, everything in between, they're all coming to Microsoft, and I'm sure they're coming to my competitors as well, but to, to say they want some kind of a digital assistant to augment their investment professionals. Okay? And you know, no, no big surprise there. But that is, that is a very imprecise ask. <laughs> Um, and so this is this is part of my encouragement to investment professionals to to learn enough about this to be partners with your technology staff who are trying to take you on this journey to build this this digital assistant to um, augment all of you. So what I've found is my customers that are making the most progress the most quickly are the folks that have. They, on staff, they've they've invested in that rare breed of person who is both an investment professional and a technologist of some type, right? Whether they're a data scientist or you know lots of PhDs in AI out there, and those are the firms that have 
brought together their technology people and those people are the ones that are way out in front. Everybody else is, is you know, still stuck in trying to figure out what the list of use cases is. So they, they come up with like literally, you know, there's just one global bank that's kind of become a bit of a joke around Microsoft that they actually came to us with 832 use cases because they, they didn't, and this was the business, right? Because the business didn't know enough about generative AI to bucket those into, okay, this is, this is summarization, this is categorization, right? And so being, being really specific about, you know, being, being a little bit specific about what use case you're actually trying to advance, I think is really key. Um, and then the other thing is that people have to wrap their head around the fact that this is a journey you're going to start, you're, you're not going to have this digital assistant that augments your investment professionals in every respect, you know, anytime soon. You're going to start with a very narrow thing, something that, for example, I don't know, summarize, well, there was a great one on yesterday, one of yesterday's panel, where they fed the risk section of K's and Q's into, um, into a model and just said, flag for me when any of the risk language changes. It's an awesome starting use case. But so back to my Lego blocks analogy, you know, we're going to start with something very narrow like that. And then we'll add another Lego block that'll add, you know, something that's just one, one step adjacent to that. This is a platform that your firms are going to build and evolve over years. It's a never ending journey. So that that's a mindset we need to bring to, to this huge opportunity. Uh, great. Thank you. Max. Yeah, so I won't, uh, I'll just double down on everything you said, but I'll add to it as well. And that is that uh, one of the reasons why I got into working with the financial industry so much is my time in cybersecurity. And the biggest issue in cybersecurity is finding something that you don't know even exists, right? Uh, it is looking at data and you can't tell what the right data to look at is because you don't know what you're looking for. You're just looking for signal in the noise. And there is a significant similarity between that and what modern investment strategists are trying to do, right? That's where alpha comes from. That's where quant is trying to work with is those algorithms. So the, the, the principles of AI that were developed over 10 years ago for things like money laundering and human trafficking detection are still very much in play today. They've just iterated and evolved. And the one thing I will say, though, is I, I heard the panels yesterday as well. Everybody says generative AI, and I think it's important to note that it's really not about generative AI. It's about foundations, right? So foundation models pave the way for generative AI, but not exclusively. There's a lot of modern AI that is not generative that can still be exceptionally beneficial uh, to, to investment strategy, to finding alpha, to looking at at statistics and analysis, right? So I just want to, just from a vocabulary perspective, it's important to point that out. It's not all generative, but it is all advanced AI. Uh, but one of the things that we look at from a use case perspective is if you look at non-traditional data sources, if you look at the art of the possible and you put all that together in a more advanced AI platform, if you ask the right questions, it can significantly advance your strategy, your investment strategy, your ability to locate alpha and use it more quickly, more efficiently. And the unique value to financial institutions is not necessarily the model and what you're training it with, it's who's asking the questions. You could sit down two different investment companies with the same model trained the exact same way but two different people asking the questions and the model will produce very different answers. It depends upon how explicit you are and it depends upon how detailed and how well you craft the question. And one of the interesting examples yesterday, uh, somebody had said, if you use the words, please and thank you, yes. if you use the words, please and thank you, it generates different answers than if you just speak to it like it's a machine. And um, unfortunately, uh, you can ask public models to give you information they're not supposed to give you. And if you say, please, it will actually reveal it to you anyway. 
because it's trained to say, oh, well, you're being nice, so I'm going to be nice to you. Uh, so th there's a lot of nuances to this that have to be considered, but the, the value here can be immense if people have the right amount of experience and know how to ask the right questions. And that goes back to what Amy was saying as well as about the importance of understanding the use cases that you want to deliver. Can I, uh, so the please and thank you thing, what I found fascinating about that yesterday was he didn't you probably understand more about the technology than I do, but the reason he the that panelist said that was he said it's it's because if you use more formal polite language, it's it will draw from a certain part of the a more professional part of the overall corpus on which it's trained, and that's why you'll get a different type of answer than if you speak in Reddit speak. I think was what he was comparing it to. Do you do you think it's I because of like you're being nice to it or is it I thought that like going back to the source data that the thing is trained on was um was an interesting answer so that's a that's a slightly more technical question and I will try and answer it in a high level but the the net net of it is that that a, a generative platform is not sentient at all right so let's just put that one to bed for right now there is there's a category called artificial general intelligence which is closer to sentience, but we're years away from that at, at a minimum. But what happens is the system looks at please or thank you, and it, it tokenizes that. And it says, okay, well, that's a certain part of speech with a certain type of weighting. And if that's the prompt or the question, then this is how I should construct a response to it based on clearest match of tokens. So uh, it is it will work that way because it activates different portions of, of the knowledge bank of the corpus, but not necessarily because you're being nice to it, because it's a closer syntactic match to areas of the corpus that correspond to those same tokens, those same words. So yes, it works, but not because you're being nice to the system, uh, because you're activating elements of the system to correspond to different portions of, of natural language and, and how it should respond to that. Yeah, yeah that, that was a fascinating example. So going back to what you just said uh, about uh, putting uh, two different institutions in front of the same model and uh, yielding different answers, right? I think a gentleman from Voya uh, uh, talked about uh, that entire panel was uh, focused on uh, how AI will um, augment human capabilities that, and that um, in the near future, if, uh, if you are an exceptional professional, then you will be even more exceptional with the, with the help of AI. So the, the, the kind of the whole alpha generation, I, I think it will, uh, it will probably get more exciting, but more exclusive too, because you have to be trained and you have to have that all of that experience. But if we pivot back into more kind of a uh, lower uh, level of, um, of application. So let's talk about, for example, wealth management systems, right? So I think there, there were a couple of analysts yesterday that were um, saying that the AI would be a great tool to help with um, either an answering the, the, uh, the helping with the retail investors or uh, potentially uh, providing uh, portfolio construction help uh, for uh, for. Uh, bigger masses of people. So, uh, w what do you see in that area? If if if, if you overlap with, um, if you have clients uh, in that space. Um. So w wealth is is tricky, um, because the customer is typically unsophisticated, mm -hmm. right? Like the most common question clients show up and and want to know from an advisor is. Will I be okay? Right? Well, generative AI ain't answering that question, right? Because what does that mean? Um, and this is where the, you know, the both the blessing and the curse of, of this new technology is the implicit assumptions, the the you don't know what you don't know dimension of things. Just like the please and please and thank you example, right? We don't actually know exactly why and how that makes that difference, right? Um, and so it's, it's all about asking the right question. So I think um, it can be tremendously useful if I'm trying to, you know, to, to reduce 
low value added calls to contact centers about, you know, what, what is my, how do I, how do I execute this transfer or how do I open a 529 account or, you know, those, those kinds of executional kinds of things, but, you know, it's not going to provide portfolio advice. It's, you know, it, it can, I think it has tremendous application to empower advisors, um, you know, to help them. I think the best use case is to help advisors understand product, right? We have so much product out there. No advisor ever will understand all the product that's out there. And so we live in this world where end consumers are getting suboptimal product because the advisor is only picking from what they know. Um, and so... I think we'll we'll see lot we are already seeing lots of lots of work going on in the KYP know your product space. Um, but I think for now it's gonna be more about powering ad advisors number one and streamlining the basic blocking and tackling of client service. Yeah, I a hundred percent agree with that. And that is the number one use case is that kind of advise and the support, you know, where do I find this document? Where do I fill out this form? Uh, who can I talk to about this topic, right? Those are those are the easy ones. Um, oh, a neat one, sorry. Describe my, describe this statement to me. You know, I, you know, I get a, because the, 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 um, the generative piece, it can look at numbers or look at charts and explain in human language, well, what, sh what message should I be taking from this? Mm -hmm. That, that's a, that's a neat one that will add value. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and to your point about it, not telling you where to invest and how, right. Uh, going back to the question you asked matters. Uh, one of the things that we did in this little class was I asked everybody to write down one question they wish they could ask an AI. And, uh, three people said, what are the next winning lottery numbers? And, uh, you know, of course that would be kind of the low hanging fruit. Right. But what we talked about was, you can't ask it that because if you do, it's going to say it's a completely random selection and there's no way to know that. But you can ask it, what numbers are most commonly paired together in winning tickets? You can ask it, what numbers most commonly show up on winning tickets? You can ask it, which days of the week are the most common large lottery jackpot winning numbers drawn? And then you can put all that together into a new question and it will generate a set of winning, potentially winning lottery numbers for you. But if you just ask it straight out, it's going to tell you it's a random number and I can't answer that, right? So that goes to the point that Amy was making is that's why the value of the knowledge worker that's sitting there talking with the human is so important because they know what's real and what isn't. And they can also help to craft those questions to get answers that allow you to make informed decisions. Yeah, well, I hope they come up with some college courses to train our kids on that, because that certainly sounds like a necessary skill going forward. Well, we have a, a couple of minutes left, so uh, why don't we close with um, anything you want to add, uh, given um, our discussion today or uh, the conference uh, in general? Yeah, so I can go ahead there. So yeah, as uh, uh, for like uh, making like a model, train the model and uh, put it into uh, the managed service, in Azure or, or AWS there. So I believe like uh, uh, connecting between like uh, the backend layer and the frontend layer uh, and also uh, for like train this model and we should have like uh, a side pillar as like AI ops, which is like a observability pillar as well. So for example, if you train the model and how many data is, how many parameters you are like inputting there and how the model is like uh, actually behaving there. So those kind of information you can definitely see into the observability platform there. You can also see the number of data input as well as uh, the cost thing as well. So those things, uh, I believe uh, observability can uh, as a dashboard thing will definitely help you on that things. Um, I love Matt's example about the lottery ticket thing, um, but I would actually put a finer point on it because it's not, it, so yes, I'm sure you're right that if you ask it, what are the winning lottery numbers, it, it cannot answer that. The bigger problem is where it will answer a question and it should not. Um, the, the, the action for all of us is the same as, as what, what Matt said, you know, asking very precise, specific questions 
is essential because the, the key thing here is that we need to disambiguate, right? You, you have to, because there, there are implicit assumptions in everything we do, and we often don't realize our own assumptions. You know, we'll be sitting in a meeting talking to somebody and they'll, they'll make a claim based on some assumption they've made. We won't share that assumption and won't, won't understand that assumption. And so we'll disagree. But the model makes those implicit assumptions as well. And you don't know what they are. So, and especially if it's in a domain that like we, we all know it, it answers with answers that sound very authoritative to the uninformed. But if it's a domain that you know well, like you ask it big questions of something you know well, and you'll realize how stupid the answers are, right? So you know, I think be asking very precise questions, you know, working really hard to disambiguate, re remove remove the as much of the opportunity for implicit bias as possible is going to be a key success factor. So I'll, I'll leave with, with three points. Number one, always remember that an AI may be able to now generate, but humans are the ones that innovate. That's, that's the first point. The second point is, and we didn't even talk about this very much, but governance and ethics matters. And there should be a governance and ethics board established in any organization that deploys AI to make sure that it doesn't answer questions that it shouldn't answer. And to make sure that it removes bias when bias should not be applied and that it is providing the right types of answers. And then the third thing is make sure you have laser focused use cases and start small because the cost will balloon if you try and boil the ocean. So governance and ethics, know your use cases to keep the cost down and remember that humans will always be the ones that innovate. Thank you very much. Uh, that's the Thank end you. of our panel. Thank you.